in between. But it's not going to be very long, I promise you. Genesis chapter 1, when you find your place, stand if you would please. Keep praying. We'll, we'll pray again at the end. I just text Pastor to see how things are going, and he has not yet gotten up. It's a community meeting, and so there's a lot of other things that they're discussing, and so haven't had our turn yet. And so anyway, we'll just keep praying, um, uh, but uh, I'm sure he'll let us know if anything's happening. Genesis chapter 1, I guess I ought to turn there too. Genesis chapter 1. And let's look at two verses. Verse number 22, the Bible says, And God blessed them. Actually, let's move up so we can get in context. Uh, verse number 20, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. Now drop down, if you would, to verse number 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female. Male and female. Male and female. Amen. Just in case anybody's confused, God made a male and female. For anybody outside, God made a male and female. He said, what are you doing? Just making a point. Just because I can. Amen. He created male and female, created he them, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. I'm going to preach on this thought tonight. Be fruitful. Be fruitful. Let's pray. We'll have a song and we'll get into the message. Heavenly Father, I do pray that you'd help us tonight. Lord, I thank you for the Word of God. I thank you for uh, the little things that you show us as we read, as we study, as we, uh, Lord, hear the Word of God. And Lord, I thank you for the thought that you've given me tonight. I pray that you'd help me to convey uh, what you've given to me. And Lord, I pray, that it would, uh, I pray that it would be an encouragement to your people. I pray it might stir us up, challenge us a little bit. Uh, Lord, and, and I pray that you would do with the message tonight what you want done. And I pray that you'd help me to get out of the way. Please empty me of myself. And Lord, I pray that you'd fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. It starts with a desire planted deep within your heart. You pray in faith and wait for God to move. Time passes and you wonder, did he hear me when I called? Should I even? at all never pray a prayer father will not answer he can't ignore his child's earnest request while you're waiting and believing for what you thought was best trust god if he says no you're still blessed there must be a greater yes there comes a time when childlike faith must graduate to trust trust come and you're convinced you're all alone 
But the teacher's often silent when you're in the hardest test. He'll answer when it's time with what is best. You never pray a prayer. Father will not answer. His child's earnest request. Why you're waiting and believing for what you thought. No, you're still blessed. There must be a greater yes. There must be a greater yes. Amen. It's a good song. We don't like no. Sometimes we get no. We don't like wait, but sometimes we get wait. A lot of times I pray and I thank God. You know, I can convince myself that I'm praying in the will of God, that I'm praying, believing, and I expect this one to be a yes. And then God says no. And in those times, sometimes the devil starts to get us thinking, you know, God's not listening to you. But God was listening, and God did answer. It just wasn't the answer I wanted. And, but God knows best, amen? And so even in those times when we question and think, I don't understand what's going on, God knows, amen? Be fruitful. I, uh, take your Bible, hold your finger there in Genesis, um, and go back to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And I'll give you just a thought of where this came from. This was just in my own study I was, I was planning to do a devotion. I'm still planning on doing this devotion with my girls, so this is good that they're not here tonight. Um, as parents, sometimes we, I have caught myself, especially here recently with teenagers, I'm, I'm on this idea a lot of don't do this. Don't do this. Don't be this. Don't say this. Don't listen to this. Don't watch this. Don't, 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 don't. And that's right. We need to tell our kids and teach our kids and, and even people that are following us, hey, there are there's plenty out there that I don't need to do, that we don't need to participate in. But the Bible, a preacher said this years ago, he said, uh, we are conformed, as humans, we are conformed to the image of our focus. And what that means is we become what we think about. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, look at the verse, verse number 21, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. This was the verse that that preacher used when he made that statement, and he taught this lesson to us in a Sunday school class. And he said, you know, there, there have been hundreds, if not thousands of people, uh, young people that grow up and maybe they had a drunkard for a father, and they said, I'm, I'm not going to be like my dad. I'm not going to be a drunk. And they focus on so much not becoming like that person that they become that person. You say, that's weird. It is weird. But we could probably all point to somebody that we know in our life, family or friend, that that's happened. They've been so focused on not doing something or not being something, and then years down the road, here they are doing or they've become what they didn't want to be. And the principle is this, I believe from the Bible, you don't overcome evil by dwelling on the evil. I, I don't want to sin. I, I don't want to cheat on my wife. I don't want to be this kind of person. I don't want to do this kind of thing. But if all I ever think about is I don't want to do this, I don't want to, what am I thinking about the most? That sin. While I'm thinking about I want to avoid it, I don't want to do it. If that's what's consuming my mind, chances are just human nature, I'm going to end up falling to that particular sin. And so the Bible says, be not overcome of evil, but you overcome evil with good. And so I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about uh, my parenting technique, and, and it's probably very, very faulty. Um, but in thinking about the idea of don't, 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 my wife actually said it to me the other day. She goes, you know, maybe we ought to start accentuating on here's what we do want you to be. Let's be this. 
let's do this. If I focus more on doing right, then I'm going to do right, and I won't have to worry about doing wrong. Instead of focusing on not doing wrong, and hopefully I do right from time to time. And that's just the way human nature goes. And so I started looking through the Bible, and I made a list, and I... I made a list of, of, I've got a bunch of them, and I'm going to do devotions with my girls with these. But the Bible says, be, and then it gives this whatever. And tonight, this was the first one I looked at. I just started in the book of Genesis, and I searched it in my Bible program. Be whatever. And be fruitful popped up. And so back in Genesis chapter 1, now listen, I understand this is going to sound very, very simple. So don't miss it. I, I, I saw this, I thought, be fruitful. How am I going to teach my kids to be fruitful? Well, I mean, in context, what are we talking about here? It's not time for my children to be fruitful. Everybody follow me? <laughs> in context of what we're talking about here. And so uh, I, I don't want to go that direction. Uh, the Bible says in verse 22, he's talking about the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, uh, the creatures that he made. And he told them the first command he gave to his creation was be fruitful. And then in verse number 26, God made man after his own image. And the first command, before God said, don't eat of the fruit, God said, be fruitful. Perfect example of what we're just talking about. God didn't start with a list of don'ts. He started with a list of do's. Focus on doing this and doing right and being fruitful and multiplying. And by the way, just stay away from that tree. You've got all the others that you can have. And you've got, I've created you to be fruitful, is what he's saying. So focus on that and not on this. Well, what was Eve's problem? What happened? Ultimately, she got her eyes off of what she should have been doing and on what she wasn't supposed to be doing. And she thought she was getting robbed of something. That is where, especially with our young people, that's where they're at. They think they're missing something in life. Everybody tells me I can't do this, don't listen to this, don't watch this, don't hang out with that person, don't go here, don't dress like this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do... And, and they think they're missing something. And maybe, this is just me thinking, but maybe we ought to start focusing on, look what you get to do when you live for God. Instead of look what you don't get out in the world. Yeah, you don't get cirrhosis of the liver from, from alcohol. You don't get cancer from smoking. You don't overdose from drug addiction. You don't do all of this. You, you miss out on a whole bunch. You sure do miss out on a whole bunch by skipping the world. And look at all the blessings and the benefits that you get by doing things God's way. Maybe we ought to focus on that. That's not the idea of the message tonight. Be fruitful. Now, I started studying this. I thought, well, this is the first one in the Bible. I'm just going to go through it. And so I was looking it up. I looked up the word fruitful. Again, this is going to be simple, but I don't want you to miss it. We're going somewhere tonight, and we're not going to be very long. Be fruitful. The word fruitful means this. You ready? To bear fruit. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Mind bomb. To bear fruit. It means to bring forth. It means to cause to be. I am causing this to happen. I am causing this to be fruitful, to cause to be fruitful, to cause to grow, to cause to increase. All right? Now, we could all look at that and say, I understand what being fruitful means. I'm supposed to be fruitful. In context, we understand what God was saying there to the children, or not to the children of Israel, to, to his creation and to Adam and Eve. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. God said, I made a couple of you. I want you to replenish, okay? But to us today, what's the, what's the application for us? God expects us to be fruitful. We're going to look at several verses here in just a minute. God created us to bring forth fruit. God created us to bear fruit. God created us to grow. That can be physically, but I'm talking more tonight spiritually, as a child of God, God did not save me to be fruitless. God did not save me to be barren. God saved me to grow or to increase. All right? Uh, I looked this up, the word fruitful, in the Webster's Dictionary, and here's what it says there. It means to be very 
productive. Some of you work jobs where you're expected to produce something. And you're expected to be very productive, right? When I worked at Home Depot, we weren't expected to be very productive. That's just the way. If we could get people to show up to work, that was a win. There was, right, Andrew? There wasn't a, I mean, they weren't, uh, if you proved yourself as a good worker, they might be on you about, hey, you need to do a little bit better. But to this other guy over here, hey, I just need you to put on the orange shirt and show up. Even if you're late, just be here. We'll throw a party for you if you come to work tomorrow. I mean, it was hard to get fired at Home Depot. If you showed up, man, you could, you could sleep through the shift and keep your job just about. Now, there's some jobs that they're not looking for that. Others are looking for that. Listen, God is not, Christianity is not Home Depot. God expects us to be productive, not just a little bit, but very productive. It means to produce, in Webster Dictionary, the word fruitful means to produce fruit in abundance. In abundance. Not just an apple tree with one apple on it, but in abundance. I mean, you want an apple tree that's loaded with apples. So many apples, they're falling on the ground before you can get to them and pick them. There's an apple tree out back at, uh, at the new church. And when I mow the yard in the spring and the summertime, it th that thing is loaded with apples. And I'm pretty sure I'm mowing more apples than I am grass when I mow the yard over there. I'm making applesauce <laughs> with that lawnmower. I mean, there's apples. Every that's what we're talking about. That thing produces much fruit. Now, I want us to think spiritually tonight. Am I being fruitful in the definition of that word? Am I producing much fruit? Let's look at some verses. God created us to bring forth fruit. That is God's design for our life. Let's skip and go all the way to the book of Psalms. See, I told you I was going to preach the whole Bible. I just skipped about 37 books for you. Psalms chapter 1. Psalms chapter 1, verse number 3. Just look at some things the Bible says about being fruitful. Psalm chapter 1, verse number 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Then verse number 3, God says if we do those things in verses 1 and 2, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth His fruit in His season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever He doeth shall prosper. All right, We could say that verse, uh, talking about the tree, that tree is successful. Being planted by the rivers of water. My grandfather has a farm uh, back in Illinois, and there's a river that runs right through his property. And in the dry times, in the summer times, uh, when there's not a lot of rain, the trees and the bushes, the grass away from the river dies much, much quicker. The trees down on the riverbank never die. They always have leaves. They're always healthy. Why? Because they're at the source of their nutrients. The soil there is good because there's water there. And those trees down there, they're healthy, they're strong, they're vibrant. They, you know, they're, they're not these little twigs of trees that get blown around when the winds come through or, or whatever. Man, they are, they are stout. That's the kind of Christian God wants us to be. A strong, solid, stout, planted, well-watered, well-nourished Christian. And those kinds of Christians produce much fruit. Again, I ask us tonight, am I bearing that kind of fruit? Am I fruitful? Ask yourself that. Am I fruitful? And so God gives us a likeness here. A healthy tree brings forth fruit. He should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. If the tree, if I'm the tree and I'm where I should be, not in the seat of the scornful, but delighting in the law of the Lord, I'm going to be that healthy tree, and I'm going to naturally bear fruit. Everybody with me? Okay. Psalm chapter 92. Psalm chapter 92. And again, I was just looking for, uh, I wasn't planning on preaching this. The preacher told me, I think, two days ago that I might have the chance to preach tonight. And so I've been looking at this since Monday. 
And uh, this is what I felt like the God wanted us to do. But uh, Psalm chapter 92, verse number 14, I was just looking up some ideas, some, some verses about bringing forth fruit. Look at verse number 14. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. Amen. Amen. I threw that one in there just for anybody who thinks, well, you know, I've done my time for the Lord. Eh. Hey, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved. God says, I want you to bear fruit. If you're still breathing, you're supposed to be bearing fruit. Amen? And it says it right there, even in our old age. I may not be able to do what I used to do, and you may not be able to do what you used to do, but you can still do something. You just got to go to God and say, God, what can I? We can all pray more. So if that was the only one that we could put on the list, even at 900 years old, I can pray. If anybody lives 900 years old, amen. That's a fruitful life. Uh, let's look at something else. Uh, bearing fruit brings more life. Look at Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11. Bearing fruit brings more life. The fruit, Proverbs chapter 11, verse number 30, the fruit of the righteous is what? A tree of life. A tree of life. Hey, fruit bearing brings more life. Think about this. I'm not a farmer. I'm not a gardener or anything like this. Uh, but my grandfather had fruit trees. My dad had some fruit trees. We had gardens when I was a kid. We planted certain plants. And if they bore fruit or they, they grew the vegetables like they were supposed to, my dad would prune those things. He would water those things. He would take care of them. And they would always produce more. But the ones that didn't produce anything, what happens to them? They get ripped up or chopped down, and something else is planted in its place that will produce fruit. And so right here, the Bible's saying to us that producing fruit brings more life. Now, I'm not saying long physical life, although the Bible does have some promises about that, but everybody wants to live a full life. Nobody wants to go through this spiritual life, this Christian life, just surviving, right? I don't, I don't want to just go through my Christianity with my head barely above water going, Oh, I'm good. I'm, I'm fine. No, man, I, I want to enjoy my life. I want to enjoy the life that God's given. God promises to give us exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. God nowhere in the Bible alludes to the fact that the Christian life will be just keeping my nose out of the water. But how many Christians are doing that? That's the life they're living. Maybe you're here tonight and you're living that life going, is this what Christianity is all about? I promise you it's not. But fruit bearing produces more life. It produces more fruit. And if I'm not bearing fruit, then I don't have a very productive life. I don't have a very full life. I don't have a very successful life. I don't have a very happy life. And so we'll see that in a minute. We'll see about producing the fruit. I'm just showing you a couple of thoughts about it. Fruit bearing is natural. Look at Proverbs chapter 12, verse number 12. The wicked desire the net of evil men, but the root of the righteous yieldeth fruit. It is natural. And we're going to see this in just a few minutes. Something that has deep roots is naturally going to bear fruit. It's naturally going to flower. It's naturally going to leave in the spring and it drops it leaves in the, its leaves in the fall. It's just going to naturally do that. A tree or a bush that doesn't have very strong, very deep roots is not going to do that. And so we've got to make sure that the analogy is, the application for us is this, we've got to be deep into our relationship with God. Shallow Christianity will get you nowhere. Shallow Christianity is keeping your nose just barely above water. Uh, we were at the, um, the summit um, over at Solid Rock. I don't remember if it was last year or the year before. And Brother Doug Fisher, uh, he lives out in California. And I think he said he planted some avocado trees. And they, the, anyway, he was talking about that. And he talked about the roots of the avocado tree and how deep they go. And then he preached on this idea of we need a deeper life or a thicker life. Christian life, thicker root system. So what does that mean? Uh, years ago, there was uh, preachers, old time, they talked about the deeper life. And they, they were called the deeper lifers. And a lot of people didn't like that. 
You spend so much time in the Bible. You spend so much time reading the Word and trying to get in the Word and trying to understand the Word that you're of no, no value out here. You're not helping anybody. All you do is read and pray, but you don't go out in the streets and help anybody. God wants balance. So those people, they were like, we're against the deeper lifers. But God says, hey, I, I want you to be, John chapter 15, he, we're part of the vine. He's the vine, we're the branches. And we've got to have deep roots if we're going to bear fruit. And so all I'm saying is it's natural. It says it right there, the root of the righteous yieldeth fruit, period. Not might, not maybe, not possibly. If you've got deep, healthy roots in your relationship with God, you're going to bear fruit. It's natural. So if I'm not bearing fruit, I am not natural. There's something wrong with me. Because... A healthy tree, a healthy whatever bears fruit. A healthy Christian bears fruit. So if there's no fruit in my life, there's something wrong with me. All right, let's look at something else. Um, bearing fruit glorifies God. Take your Bible to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I hope I'm not boring anybody tonight. This is a little bit more teachy. John chapter 15, verse number 8. Herein is my Father glorified that ye what? Bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Revelation chapter 4, verse number 11, I believe, says that we're created for His glory. So it glorifies God then that I bear much fruit. Again, I ask the question, are you, am I bearing fruit? Am I, like this verse says, bearing much fruit, abundant, that, that over uh, more than plenty, more than is, is necessary, I'm bearing much fruit. Am I bearing fruit at all? Or am I bearing much? Bearing fruit glorifies God. Bearing fruit gets our prayers answered. Look at verse number 16. You've not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go for or go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. And so prayer, uh, our prayers are answered if we're bearing fruit. Look at that verse again. He's chosen us, he's ordained us that we should what? Bring forth fruit. And the end of the verse says, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. You want God to answer your prayers? You better be a fruit-bearing Christian. Simple. So I ask it again. I'm going to hammer this home tonight. Are we bearing fruit? The Bible says be fruitful. What kind of fruit should we bearing? Should we be bearing? Well, what do apple, apple trees produce? Apples. What do grapevines produce? Grapes. What do orange trees produce? Orange, right. So what should a Christian be producing? Christians. That's one fruit. We should be producing Christians. Am I producing other? Listen, I can't save anybody. We understand that tonight. I'm not the one that saves. I'm not the one that forgives sins. But I am the messenger. And God uses individuals to talk to other individuals and give them a message from him. And if that individual gets saved and gets into a relationship with God, then I was the human instrumentation or you were the human instrumentation that God used to bring that person. That's bearing fruit. But sometimes we get discouraged because we knock on doors and people aren't interested. Right, Brother Eustace? People don't want to hear it. Uh, I had a guy tonight walking down the street. Uh, actually, I think Miss Candy tried to hand him a track. And he's like, I'm Muslim with a dirty look on his face. That's, that's too bad for him. You know, he's going to have to, something's going to have to happen to enlighten him and open his eyes. But it's not my job to do that. I can try to hand out a gospel tract. I can try to persuade him like Paul said, we persuade men. But ultimately, it's his choice. But we, get, we run into people like that and we think, this doesn't even work. Why should I keep doing this? Let me just say this and we'll move on. Being faithful to witness for the Lord is part of being fruitful. God never said, if you give the message, they will get saved. 
God said in Matthew chapter 4, verse number 4, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So if I'm not fishing, it's because I'm not following. That, there's your soul winning message for the night. But what other kind of fruit is there that we could be bearing? I, want to, I just want to show you a couple of things. Galatians chapter 5, people often go to this. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. Galatians, I can't find it. Galatians chapter 5. Look at verse number 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now, those are good things, and those ought to be evident in our life. But that's not my fruit. What's it say in verse 22? The fruit of the Spirit. Go back up and look at verse number... Uh, no, verse number 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Verse number 16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So if I'm walking in the Spirit, those are the fruits of the Spirit. Those are fruits that He produces in my life. I can't produce love in my life. We love Christ. We love Him because He first loved us. I didn't know how to love until I met the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, so I can't produce love. I can't produce joy. I'm so fickle in my life that the weather ticks me off. Right? You guys all know me. If it ain't snowing, I'm disappointed. Me and the sun don't get along. And so I can't, if I can't even handle the weather, I, how am I going to produce joy in my own life? I can't. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Peace. I can't bring peace in my life. That's the fruit of the Spirit. And so these things ought to be in our life, but these things only happen when I'm walking in the Spirit. Now let me show you something. We're done. Second Peter chapter two. Second Peter chapter one. I told you it was very, very simple. This whole idea of being fruitful. But here I think is the key to all of it. Second Peter chapter one, verse number five. And the pastor preached on this last night at the Bible study. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. So God says right here, giving all diligence. That means on purpose. That means intentional. I used to say this, we have to live our lives on purpose. Too many people live in lives just by accident. What do you mean by that? They, whatever happens that day, oh, I'm just going with the flow. I don't, I'm just, whatever happens, happens. And we're, we react instead of act. Well, in reaction, there's no thought process in that. You punch me, my reaction is what? I'm going to punch you back. But if I choose to act, then when you punch me, I've made a decision. I am not going to react like what's natural. I'm, not, I'm making a decision. And so we need to live on purpose. We need to act and not react. And so whose responsibility right here in these verses, whose responsibility is it to add these things to my life? Yeah. Look at what he says. Add to your faith these things. Now, understand, if we go back up and look, and the pastor did this, uh, he explained this well last night, obviously, uh, it's not me. Philippians chapter 3 or chapter 2 verse 13 says this, uh, For it's God which worketh in you both to will and to do. We can go back to Galatians, uh, walk in the Spirit. What does that mean? If I let the Spirit control me, then this will be, I can't do this on my own. All right? But these are my responsibility as a Christian. So I need to walk in the Spirit, and then I can add these things to my life. But if I'm reacting, if I'm living a reactionary life, Something makes me mad and I just fly off the handle. I'm not walking in the Spirit. And I won't be adding, I guarantee you, any of these things to my life. So it takes the power of God and the Spirit of God to do this. But this is my responsibility. Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. That's moral excellence. Doing right. And then to virtue, knowledge. And then to knowledge, temperance. And then to temperance, patience and to patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity 
Listen, I'm not going to define all those things, take the time to go through all of those things. Pastors preached it here before. Uh, but go home and look those words up, find out what they are. But here's the, here's the whole idea. If you want to you be a good soul winner, you better add these things to your life. There's no greater brotherly kindness or charity than to, than to teach somebody what the Bible says about their eternal salvation and they get saved. That's charity. That's love. That's brotherly kindness. That's patience to deal with some knucklehead who doesn't want to believe it and you go back to work with them and say, listen, man, God did this for me and God did this for me. And listen to the verse, man, I don't want to hear about your God. Well, I can't help it. God's my whole life. And you just keep going and you have patience to deal with their obstinance and patience to deal with their ignorance. Yeah. You want to bear some fruit in soul winning? You better be adding some things to your life. You want to bear some fruit in other areas? You better be adding some things to your life. And here's why. Look at verse number 8. For if these things be in you and abound. That means they're, they're, they're in you a whole bunch. I mean, the preacher said it last night. It's just hanging off of you. Godliness and brotherly kindness and charity and love and, and, and temperance and virtue and all of these things. It's just it's evident in your life. That's what it means to abound. I mean, it's just obvious. If these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor, what's it say? Unfruitful. God said in Genesis chapter 1, the very first command he gave to humanity, be fruitful. And right here he says, if you'll add these things, it'll keep you from being unfruitful so I ask you again tonight I ask me am I being fruitful what's the opposite of being fruitful anybody unfruitful there you go I didn't think it was that hard of a question I could start with an easier one how about what's your name right the opposite of being fruitful is being unfruitful well, what is, what is the remedy for unfruitfulness right here? Me, through the power of God, through the Spirit of God, adding these things to my life. Now, here's what God gave me. And beside this, giving all diligence. We have all sat in church and heard a tremendous message from a good preacher or a not-so-good preacher or whatever, and we've thought, and that was good. I need to make a decision about that. And we come down here, and we pray, and we make decisions, and we go home, and we do nothing different. That's not giving all diligence. That's me. I'm describing me. And I could, I could name you dozens of messages that I've heard in my life that, that I have said that was a life changer. And it didn't change my life. Why? Because I didn't give all diligence to add that thing to my life. And if I'm not adding them to my life, I will be, it says it right there, I will be unfruitful. And if I'm unfruitful, I'm how can I think if I'm not adding those things and that makes me unfruitful, how can I bear fruit in any other area of my life? So are we adding anything? Are we giving all diligence to add? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Went longer than I intended. When was the last time you added something to your life? When was the last time you gave all diligence to add something to your life? There's seven things listed there. Maybe we ought to maybe we ought to make a list. 